Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon once again. Thank you very much you found the opportunity to attend this session today, and I hope that it will be interesting and useful at the same time. I am Valeria Mazganova, and I am in charge of the real estate department of Business SM, and I will be moderating this session. Later, I will introduce to you all our panelists, and now I should like to ask you, all of you, to take your mobile phones and to switch off the sound because the practice proves that the information is digested. Very, di It will be very difficult to digest all the information from the first time because it will distract your attention. And as an introductory, I can tell you that the market of real estate speaks, proves the final stage of what the construction process is. It is the square meters, it is the prices, the new projects, the consumers demand the position of the authorities with regard to the real estate. And today we will be talking about what it has started from. We will talk about green technologies, construction materials. We will talk about what takes our attention more and more now. Maybe it's not myself, not only myself, but some of you attended uh, the exhibition, Maypim which was held in Cannes, and in every profile session, there was a question raised, the quality, green technologies, construction, what we are building, for whom we are building, and consequently, the question that we will be discussing today, well, who needs these green quality, high quality, and high technologies? So in our discussion, the following persons will take part I will introduce to you this, uh, the um, Yuri Yelisev, the head of the enterprise steel construction, vice president Techni Nikol, uh, Evgeny Voilov, Voilov, and the president of Alex Construction, uh, Kevin Langley. I appeal to all of you, since you found yourself necessary to come here and to spend one hour and a half, let's not be passive, let's be active, let's not only listen to the smart guys who will talk to you, please be involved, be engaged, ask questions, because you can listen to the presentation, uh, but I appeal to your activity, but a bit later. And at the moment, let's start with the green technology. This is a very fashionable, like a fashionable uh, topic. Uh, it's like a general in the wedding. And we are in favor of the green technologies. It's not a secret that in Moscow, we have a number of buildings, not only commercial buildings, but also apartment houses, residences, which have uh, undergone standards. We have local standards of the green construction. They are operating as recommendation, but it is not excluded that they will be approved and adopted as a necessity for the construction companies. You all know uh, the program of the energy res uh, saving programs, and you know the uh, how these programs are supported. So I would like to ask this question to Kevin and to ask him, what does it mean for a modern construction world, for the Russian construction world and for the international construction world? What does it mean, the green technology, and are they so important? Let's try that, try that again. It's an honor to be here in Moscow, coming from the other side of the world. And I think to answer that question that she asked, we also have to take into context the country, 
and the region and the city where that construction takes place. Because as we all know, construction is a complex thing of the, the builders um, and, the, and the construction company and the architect and the government and the interplay of having a lot of resources come together at one, one point in time with the, with the creation of a, of a developer's vision of what it looks like. And in the context of whether it's a government building or a private sector building. So I think a lot of the driver has to go back down to the wishes of the developer and that interplay of the complexity of what it's going to actually cost. Because everybody wants energy efficiency. Sometimes it's a question of whether you want it in the beginning of the job and in savings or if it's a long-term decision. So I think the answer is, is, is are we chasing a short-term or long-term decision on the, co the actual cost of greening a building and making it more ener energy efficient because sometimes those costs are significantly up front. What we're seeing in the U.S. is a lot of solar technology being implemented, but it's being implemented because there's some type of tax savings. It's actually more expensive to implement because of the tax savings that's going into play. On the residential side, we're seeing a lot of small solar contractors taking advantage of the tax savings and pulling together packages that are cost effective and affordable for individuals to make those decisions. So I'll leave it, leave it at that. <laughs> well, is it possible to talk in details about the saving contracts, the resource saving contracts? What are the figures? Could you give us an example about the cost figures, efficient. cost efficient contracts? It's, it's so hard to generalize, but I can say on a, like a residential, uh, typical residential installation of a s solar system is usually around 30 to 40,000 US. And there's some significant, almost as much as 80% cost savings on that, that installation of, a, of this typical solar installation, which is, um, it's strictly tax driven. Mm -hmm. Kevin, uh, Kevin, could you tell us immediately, we have a question. Uh, do consumers like your efforts uh, your green technology. How they respond? Uh, are they attractive for the consumers? Is your green technology project uh, attractive for the consumers? Most consumers like the idea of green construction, but as we know, when we implement it, generally there's some trade-off, and when the trade-off happens, when there's a cost involved with that trade-off. There's a decision made. Um, I also want to point out some of the, I would say, major trends on how this is becoming more efficient. Um, first is this modular design, creating a system that can fit on buildings and structures fairly efficiently without having to redesign the systems is actually making it very affordable. So the, the demand is being driven by the consumer and the awareness of the consumer and then the modular design is actually being implemented to lower the cost savings to make it more cost effective. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank, you, Kevin. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. If you have questions which you want to raise now, please raise your hand and, ra and ask your question if you, well, if you want to ask questions later, please ask them in the course of the discussion. And now we move from the green construction to the construction materials to the construction technologies. The position of the business, position of the government, how to make an enterprise profitable, how to make a profitable enterprise even more profitable. And we will talk about it, and I give the floor to Mr. Yuri Yeliseev. Good afternoon, dear uh, colleagues. I understand that we are all entrepreneurs, and we work in the construction area. Thank you very much to, to the organizers for having invited me. Uh, first of all, I want to tell our moderator about the green construction, because all over the world there is a sustainable design a notion of sustainable design, which means that all construction material, all constructions should be projected, taking into consideration the fact that it, 
in order not to bring harm to the environment, to the nature, and they have to be prepared, assembled, and utilized in the same way. And there are certain standards which in our country are not approved whatsoever. And uh, if we talk about the green construction, what is called sustainable design all over the world, it foresees and envisages introduction of innovations, but our, in our country, innovations are prohibited by law, uh, by a special decree which was signed by Mr. Putin, who was at that time the prime minister of the country. He, well, he does not permit. Uh, well, he did not permit. Uh, and he in charge the ministries. Ministry of Construction was set up on the 1st of March. And until that time, there was nothing in the regions. They didn't have any specialists. They didn't have any people who could write anything. And nobody could invent anything. And uh, you are all participants. You've created something new. You have to tell us uh, how to use this new, this innovation, but it is forbidden by law. Then sustainable design as a green construction has penetrated to the world structures very recently, probably uh, 10 years ago, maybe more. But what does it envisage? It envisages the change of standards all over the world. And all over the world, the standards are voluntary. There is only one technical regulation which is compulsory. And from the last year, in the countries of the European Union, this standard became to operate. There are certain norms which cannot be infringed, pending criminal persecution but all other things, how you have to deal with the environment, it's up to you. There are some voluntary decisions, voluntary standards, and evaluation what you are doing. And you have to prove that you make your production safe. What we did in our country, we have a kind of a manual safety of constructions, but nobody uses these standards of safety because there is no legal platform, no legal basis of correspondence to this manual, to this regulation. In order to make construction safe, a number of bureaucrats from the Ministry of Construction, they do not want to live a hard life, but they want to receive very good money. They ask, they lobbied the government, and the government issued a degree, a statement, 1047, which states that construction will be considered safe only if uh, the conditions of standards and uh, state standards will be fulfilled, which are present on this compulsory list. I work in the construction reel in the steel region since 1970. I didn't leave this area. I set up a small enterprise one year, six months before this law was adopted. So I've gone through all this route. So I can tell you that all these state standards, all these specifications which are reflected in the statement 1047, they are extreme state standards. And the last one of them has been reviewed in 1980. And now Nostroy, Mostroy, they just rewrite these old standards as they do not pay attention to the nuances, to the minute details. For example, about the windows, they wrote that the gap between the frame of the window and the, and the uh, wall should be filled with cotton with cotton, but we are living in 2014, and this is a law, and we have to stick to this law. How can we talk about ecology if the whole policy is striving to not, I don't want to say, uh, to disrupt the entrepreneurship, but uh, to bring harm to entrepreneurship. Uh, for example, in my enterprise, for 10 years, we 
we make a product which is similar to the Western companies, to the American companies' product. The profile, it is the profile and is the most sold product in the world. But I cannot sell it. It has to be corresponded to the project. It has to be done by the project. And by the project makers, they cannot help us. We've be, we've undergone through the Moscow catalog. We've been we've undergone through different uh, bureaucratic procedures, but they do not use our profile because our profile is not included into the statement 1047, and it will not go to the market. So it's the end of innovation. What innovations are we talking about if they are not reflected in the law? In Wikipedia tell, tells us what innovation means, and I took a Soviet encyclopedic vocabulary, and it says that innovation, it's a new format of a word. We don't have a law, and we don't have a notion of innovation. How can we push forward a new product? It is impossible if in 90s, for us, all the niche uh, were open we could take everything we wanted plus the system which was created in the Soviet Union was used at that time. Now the system has been fully destroyed. We don't have any construction industry and we cannot talk about governing of this construction. It is very difficult to find a niche today. And in addition, last but not the least, uh, the new entrepreneurs, they are smart people, they read books, they are intelligent, they use smart words, and sometimes I even do not understand them. And they think that they came to our sphere of entrepreneurship and to the construction, and they see the ready-made interface, the structure exists, the interface exists, and they have just to fulfill this item or that item. Everything is excellent. But on the opposite, we don't have such an infrastructure. And all these new people, they are politically impotent. They do not understand that they have to they have to fight for pushing forward their wisdom, their smartness, and they have to fight for the society. Policy, politics, it's a number of sets and methods which are used by a family uh, for, uh, as, a part, as a means of a defense, for defense of their personal interests. So uh, our policy in the construction industry should defend our interests. So an example of the attitude to our uh, industry of construction of building and materials so all is like this. So you know you, you cannot build anything without building materials. So now a regulation was issued on self-regulating uh, uh, organizations found some designers uh, and uh, builders um, and other people, but they absolutely forgot about the uh, manufacturer, the manufacturing part of this chain. So uh, because when, when they, we come to different manufacturers, they say, so we produce a lot of uh, building materials, but we are not an industry. We do not, uh, you know, do we, we do not um, refer to uh, the industry of construction. Though the Ministry of Construction has been set up in this country. And there are also people who are uh, uh, just inherently inert. Uh, so they don't understand that they need to struggle for this industry if you work here. So it doesn't mean that, uh, well, actually, that you should physically fight for it, but certainly you should prepare different addresses, different messages that should be transferred to the ministry, to the authorities, because, uh, well, we should think about the future generations. So it's a rather complicated pathway, and I can talk about this infinitely.
Uh, Yuri, just a couple of words, uh, a couple of positive words. So, uh, well, did you see something good during the last decade whenever it's uh, after the degrade of the industry? Yes, I saw. So suddenly I work in this industry. We produce uh, zinc, zinc flooring. So this is our zinc steel and uh, sheets. And, uh, you know, this type of product during uh, the past 10 or now 15 years um, raised tenfold. And uh, we used to have uh, only one uh, uh, manufacturer in Lipis who produced it, and now we have uh, uh, two large manufacturers, two large smelters. But they, um, uh, well, and it, they understand uh, that uh, this material is cost efficient and uh, it uh, lets the builder to work faster. So, and it also appeared to be profitable for metalworks. No, I cannot hear the question. I'm sorry. He needs the mic. I am Berezovsky Dmitry. Uh, I'm head of the board of the Berezovsky Chemistry, so I know that you've done quite a lot for the for our industry and that you promoted it, uh, uh, just uh, especially in the area of steel production. We're still lagging behind, so and uh, we have joined to the uh, Euro Code three. So and uh, I, um, I, it's my first meeting with you, but I heard anything that would be positive. So, do you, well, in your speech, uh, I could single out only some negative aspects, and that's it. So, uh, actually, there are quite a lot of positive changes in our sectors. We have a council for the eco construction, uh, and uh, in the Alimstroy company, where also you know there are a few regulations in this area who have been adopted. Uh, you know, we've also set up uh, some you know holdings. Uh, where we uh, uh, try to move to the construction of smart houses, and there are a few pilot uh, designs. So there is also a very interesting project for a high rise uh, on the basis of, uh, de of sustainable development uh, on uh, based on the green standard, and we also uh, uh, won a competition in eco construction in London and. Uh, co and um, the program co-builder. So in technology and the methodologies, uh, uh, we have a lot of advances on, uh, as regards the impact of uh, construction materials on the environment. And it was also highly appreciated uh, in the global community. Uh, we developed a methodology and calculator for the life cycle of a building. So we work together with the uh, utility uh, services and on April 2nd, uh, we will have a meeting. We will uh, talk about the contract system and how to calculate the operational costs. Uh, so there are some other aspects, and uh, there are entrepreneurs uh, who uh, uh, set up their own community, which is actually progressing. Uh, the, on the ba it's first of all, our community on the basis of the Moscow Con uh, Construction University, headed by its rector. Uh, this is also the organization called Teco Standards at the Ministry of uh, Natural Resources. Uh, uh, we have also established a national eco construction cluster, uh, so, uh, and we received a lot of support. Uh, we, we prepared a lot of programs a lot of norms and rules in this area. And uh, we know that uh, the Ministry of Construction, um, you know, it is um, uh, uh, 
uh, well, uh, hasn't joined, you know, this movement so far. I don't know why, uh, but uh, we have a lot of innovations, a lot of pilot project uh, stage in Moscow. Have, uh, for example, a smart school building and uh, a smart uh, child care center, uh, also a building for the retired. Uh, there is another project together with Moscow government uh, to construct a building, an eco building, a high rise, and we work together with uh, over it with an architect. Uh, um, no, and so there are quite a lot of positive aspects on this. So I have a question. Uh, so can I combine a, these two speeches and draw a conclusion that uh, all good aspects are somehow uh, uh, somehow counteract those negative aspects, first of all, a mess and regulations and so on. Um, is my gut feeling correct? Uh, no, I don't think so. So uh, we work uh, in uh, Greenfield after the Olympic ga Games. The government officially stated that uh, we've got the eco construction in this country. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, well, uh, any uh, uh, conference on construction uh, starts with the sustainable design or eco construction, but we still uh, we still face some issues and concerns. For instance, uh, we've started to uh, to build a child care center based on the eco standard, and uh, in the experimental building in Moscow, in pilot project, um, we. We stick to uh, eco standards, and uh, we will be famous in the, uh, in the world through that. So uh, we have a laboratory, a smart city, a laboratory of green standards. So we start cooperating with the government, and on March. So uh, we'll be present at the Commission of uh, uh, on Standardization, and uh, Mr. Volkov will uh, uh, talk about the new standards in construction and architecture and design. And uh, uh, now, uh, well, uh, this platform now is ongoing its registration in the Ministry of Economic Development. And uh, while uh, forming a platform uh, which we call construction and architecture, uh, we will be able to, uh, to, dr to draft a common policy in this area. So we shouldn't just complain and do nothing. Uh, certainly, uh, the position of the government is rather inert in this dimension. But still, we should uh, you know, take care of that because, of, first of all, of environmental threats and challenges all over the world. Here in this audience, uh, maybe we, we see the people who are directly related to the production area. Please raise your hands. Those who think that uh, in this country we can see uh, some active steps towards uh, sustainable design and eco construction? Uh, who thinks th so that eco uh, is uh, actually existent in this country? Okay, so this is the sampling. Maybe you have some particular proposals how to. Uh, accelerate this now, not accelerate. That's wrong. Uh, maybe to to make to intensify it and and to make it more, uh, you know, uh, more f focused. Uh, I can say that what we did. Uh, for example, uh, I've been doing this for 15 years, and uh, uh, I deal with the technical regulations, and I was the. Uh, uh, the first to write the pioneering technical standard procedure uh, in this area. So, but I, I was the only one who did it. So, uh, and it was passed to the state, to the parliament, to the state Duma. And after in a year, we we see this regulation, but with a lot of mistakes. Uh, but uh, I wanted to talk to the author, but uh, and uh, uh, actually I couldn't find out. Uh, 
who was the author, and uh, uh, 10 years ago, I was the first to pronounce the word European codes, Euro codes. We translated uh, the standards for Russia, but it, it appeared useless because to harmonize the standards, uh, uh, it was not a piece of cake and was quite a challenge. And together with the British Institute of Standards, we uh, worked for half a year to harmonize the standards. And the, at that time, our British peers uh, were eager to help us uh, uh, absolutely free. They volunteered to that because they wanted Russia to recognize the circle codes as an alternative approach. And uh, this is an approach that has been recognized it is Europe since 1972. And uh, only last year in this country, in November, a communique was signed, a communique with the European Union that we recognize on a framework basis this, such standards. And uh, the work in Belarus, uh, all social. Uh, uh, well, talking about our you know, cooperation with Belarus, so they now have the system of technical regulations in, uh, our, uh, in alignment to the European system. They have the system. Uh, we don't need to change anything in this. We may just duplicate this Belarusian system. Uh, this year codes were translated into Russian, and this uh, system has been implemented in uh, Belarus. So, but what is inspiring? So on March 13 of this year, the Prime Minister Medvedev had a, a session of the cabinet, and uh, which uh, dealt with our, uh, the technical regulations and construction and. Uh, well, assignments were uh, distributed over the officials uh, to get through the situation with Euro codes, so, so for us to understand if they need them or not, should we join it or not, or we should stick to the Chinese system. But you know, in China, uh, they have a, 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 uh, they tend to American standards. Well, okay, thank you very much. So that's it for the uh, sustainable design and the construction. Maybe it makes sense for us to invite our Belarus, uh, Belarus colleagues and uh, to listen to them, how they passed through this pathway. But next time, OK, we'll do it at the next Congress. Now, but now let's uh, pass over to the production. And I invite Evgeny Volov. Uh, he represents Techno Nikol. It's kind of a business case. He will talk uh, about the growth of this company and uh, its history uh, and how they managed to achieve the indicators we see today. Thank you, Valeria. Good afternoon, everybody. And Yuri uh, talked about a lot of concerns. And I'd say that the techno Nicole company try to avoid, if possible, uh, the interrelation with the government. Uh, because we knew all these issues, we all, always tried to address them ourselves. So, And what we achieved will be shown to you later. Well, uh, I will cite a lot of figures, and certainly it will be easy for you to see them on the overheads than just to hear. So um, I cannot see the overheads, but uh, uh, hope you can see them. So some time ago in the journal Expert, some uh, a, a, a paper on uh, transport technologies was published uh, with uh, uh, very interesting data to illustrate the growth in China in this area. It was a real breakthrough how they duplicate and replicate everything. But actually, they've passed all these uh, all evolution steps and now approach their own innovations. I don't know where is the link between technical and China. Maybe you will. Uh, just uh, identified it in my talk. So technically called today uh, is not a small or medium business. It is a company with a turnover about uh, 60 
a billion rubles, and uh, it, uh, it supplies these products to all more than 30 countries all over the world, and uh, by some products, it ranks number one in the world. So here you can see some statistics. Um, uh, for example, uh, in the f uh, Forbes, uh, in the year of 2013, Forbes ranks as number one in uh, building material manufacture in Russia. So how did we start? Uh, well, uh, these were young entrepreneurs, students who started it up. So we did it in 1992. Hard times, you know, and they started uh, with the uh, with roofing first of all using rubber oil, and then they started to sell it. And in 1995, they bought the first uh, production unit for forty thousand dollars. This is the city of Viberg near Finland, and uh, so they, it was quite a torture, you know, for them because they didn't know how to you know to approach it. But now how it looks like today, and um, this is a plant which uh, uh, exercises experts to Europe, first of all to Scandinavian countries, and with a very, uh, 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 very you know, fault fighting as regards the quality. And um, uh, then, you know, we're actually lucky, and uh, we started to establish different uh, uh, production facilities under the uh, under one roof insulation material. So that was the strategy what we, that was picked. And uh, you can see this, uh, how it works in the picture. So after the crisis, we uh, started only one area. These are profilated membranes. Um, and uh, well, it didn't cost much. And we managed to buy a production line in Europe. Actually, we didn't buy it, but uh, that was a barter. And um, during you know the crisis, certainly impacted the construction sector, including us. But we assess these results as positive, and I'll tell you why. This is our geography. So there are, our facilities are located, um, thank you very much. Um, uh, so our lo facilities are located across the Russian Federation. Uh, f um, just certainly uh, facilitate the transportation routes. Uh, we have a few facilities in Europe. Uh, not long ago, we bought uh, one uh, facility in uh, Italy. Uh, it is uh, the membrane producer. So we also would like to cover uh, Africa to include it in our network. And the most interesting fact is. Uh, well, I'll show you some fa figures uh, which I haven't shown so far. So I wanted to single out uh, the key paradigms of our business, and uh, they are as follows. First, well, we, we should, you shouldn't think that you are the smartest in this world. So that's why we started to learn lessons uh, globally regarding the new technical solutions and materials. So that's number one. First of all, we learn lessons uh, and uh, just acquire best practices and implement them here in Russia. Next, and maybe the most important thing, that is the uh, resource-saving technology. We actually duplicated it from Toyota. Uh, you know, it's a unique production, highly efficient, and so we could successfully implement a lot of uh, you know, a lot of um, aspects from it. So one of our drivers in our trade is our own uh, trade networks, and this is uh, actually a driver that allows us to launch new production facilities. Uh, so uh, we uh, try to promote kind of a combinatory or a cluster cluster based approach. So we just lo locate all production units around one facility. And now we approach a situation where we can uh, supply just a kind of a kind of a totality of our products to our consumer, and it is very convenient for our consumer. A few words about innovations. So I'm running short of time, so that's why I'll accelerate. So the uh, key principle of our company, this is a leadership in 
costs. Uh, we take care of costs. You know, we uh, we try to have a minimum uh, costs, and then uh, certainly the production costs also will be minimal, and will be highly competitive. So, uh, so p p productivity. We have uh, uh, some uh, facilities have 25 percent higher productivity than in Europe. Uh, our Europeans. Uh, now the uh, uh, next. Uh, so we think that we don't need to have uh, uh, a lot of um, auditors inside uh, the company. Oh, we need to uh, to build the quality into the production process. We don't have a special department for that. Uh, every worker at the production line is responsible for quality. So we uh, restructured our operations uh, guided by this principle. Uh, so we try to pick only those areas where we can physically be leaders in the market. It's our key principle, and if we cannot be leaders in the market, then we won't move uh, in this uh, direction. Uh, so and uh, what uh, which areas have been rejected? Uh, but uh, no, no, no area. No, just we, we we didn't reject an area actually, st stemming from this principle. No, the productivity data is fresh. And in money, so we can assess it like this. So and here is the trend, and this is due to the crisis. So we had a fast growth, uh, some you know 30, 50 percent per year, and we didn't take care of our costs. But the crisis uh, just let us uh, think it over because we had huge loans at the time. So we took a pause and take our time, and the result of uh, you know this activity, you can see in the overhead. So certainly it wasn't easy, but uh, now the logistics is three times more efficient than we used to have before the crisis. And um, uh, so rational investments, just a few words uh, uh, by the bullets which you saw. So we buy equipment which is the best in the world. So this is a principal approach. It is the most reliable and the most powerful production lines because these lines uh, allow us to raise uh, or to make to maximize our productivity. Then we choose the markets uh, where the high efficiency of entrance. For instance, the um, uh, a plastic foam, uh, so we rejected it. So potential capacity of lines because the uh, trade network should uh, pro should ensure the supply for each production line. So it, it, sh it should be loaded for at least 60 percent. Only after that we launch it. So the pay investment pay uh, return on investments is uh, uh, at average three five years. We don't use leverage loans. We use only only our, our own capital, about six, seven uh, billions would be invested in uh, our own facilities. I won't elaborate on our trade network. Uh, uh, no logistics, just a few interesting figures. So we don't have our own transport. Uh uh, we do have 200 partners whom we work with, cooperate, and we develop them. In this connection, small business is attached to our enterprise. Why should we create uh, an operator? We know the production. We have people who know logistics, and we have many of them, and they help us. They organize their own business and do it very effectively, and they help us to move our business forward. Well, last year we had 180,000 trips uh, a year, and for one night we had 400 lorries, 400 trucks from one site. From one site, I don't want to tackle services now. Uh, the main competitive advantage is our complexity and our systems that we've managed to work out because there is no other company in the world which provides and manufactures isolation products. In order to save expenditures, we have to automatize many programs uh, which calculate very quickly, project very quickly. As far as the innovations are concerned, uh, well, they are forbidden, but we in 
introduce them. How we consider in innovations, if innovation does not bring any benefit, if there is no reason to use this innovation. And the innovation should save expenditures, but we don't think that this is a real innovation. According to statistics of our scientific centers, we have 700 million rubles due to the introduction of innovation. It was done last year. This is the figures. So a couple of words about the uh, a couple of general words due to the fact uh, we started to teach our supervised superintendents subcontractors we have 11 centers uh, 11 centers 10 centers and 11th will be open in minsk 17000 people go through our courses every year i think that we are compelled to do it because the system of education does not prepare subcontractors and now we work uh, we work closely and we we've um, issued a special manual for constructors and sometimes you can um, meet the word technical in this manual what we've managed to do in our industry practically we um, we managed to move from rubyroid to the polymer materials and uh, talking globally uh, we have opportunities in Russia uh, less opportunities in Russia for doing business than all over the world. And that is why we recommend to everybody to choose the, pro the global approach. We've managed to cover Europe to go to the European market. It was very difficult to go to the uh, Eng uh, British markets, but we managed to, to take our place in the markets of Great Britain. And next year, we are planning, this year and next year, we are planning to go to the US market. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I have only one question. Since what has been presented here, it's like a closed circuit. Uh, you do not need any regulation by the government. You don't need introduction of any ministries. Is it so or not? Well, it means that for you, it doesn't matter what happens in the governmental authorities, what kind of statements they adopt or what kind of degrees they adopt. Do you want me to answer yes? I want you to answer no. It, it matters. Of course, it matters for us because uh, there are so many interesting things which happen in Duma and in the ministries that our hair goes up. And we want all these statements, all these decrees and laws to not hinder our, the process. Oh, we are participating together with Yuri in different events. We are asking questions. We say why we do it, why you do it. And sometimes we are being heard. And I think that we've managed to achieve some progress. So I'm listening to you, and I came to the conclusion that the governmental bureaucrats, especially lawmaking politicians, they have to take an oath, to take an oath like it was done by Hippocrat. Uh, don't bring any harm. Talking about Technonicol, this is a global company. And um, probably those of you who are sitting here, you do not imagine companies of such a level. Some of you are at the startup level. Some of you are dreaming of the development. But what does it mean for you coming to the market of construction, uh, coming to the market of the construction market uh, materials, is it realistic to have your place in this market? And how to make your business more literate if you are a small company and even if you are at the level of the first factory or maybe you are only looking for your first factory, for your first plant? Well, 
I think that the places that are already occupied, they should be occupied, and we don't need any newcomers. But at the same time, there are lots of places where you can go with your creative ideas, with your new approaches. We have many post-Soviet organizations which could be substituted by the modern construction companies, by the modern industry, but you have to be courageous, you have to be active. For us, it was very difficult. We've survived two credit crunches, uh, two crises, and uh, it's a different time now, but I think you still should go forward. Probably you don't go for the big things, for the large things, but there are small businesses, small enterprises. Uh, I would like to repeat that uh, we don't have any transportation, our own transportation company, but small and medium business transportation companies, they are growing together with us. Many other companies are growing with us. We have many niches where there is a place to grow. For example, the low buildings and we will introduce a new project we will need like a hundred partners who will buy our materials and then they will earn on their construction so i understand that this is a strategy of a fish which is glued to the other fish and i think this strategy is justified And please introduce yourself. Mariewska Olga, I am an auditor and I am a financial expert. I've dealt a lot with the evaluation of the cost efficiency of construction and of different materials, and especially I dealt with, with the low, low buildings. Uh, I have a question, probably. Uh, you could take a, like a, like for example a construction a building and to build it out of your own materials and would it be a saving resource saving would it be ecologically saving i mean using only your materials would it be ecological and resource saving yeah, well, we are planning a construction of cottages. I would say that it is, there is no reason to buy a heat isolation from abroad. So the production, the manufacturing should be within a distance of 500 kilometers. I'm talking about the heat isolation materials. And uh, talking about the diversification of the manufacturing in our territory, I would say that our product is very competitive. Ecological certificate, we, oh, we do have ecological certificate for our products. We are planning now to construct a number of cottages of houses which will be ecologically ecological resource saving and cost efficient and it will contain all what you've already mentioned so we can cooperate with you thank you yuri what is your opinion is it realistic today for the new companies for the startup companies to come to the market of construction materials no it is not realistic this cluster policy its main purpose is to do the money laundering uh, by way of uh, setting up and creation of small enterprises. It doesn't have any other purposes. I would say that this uh, cluster works like a fish, like a fish which is glued to a bigger fish. A big global enterprise cannot live without governmental policy because uh, it has to provide safety safety and security for the environment, for the people, for the animals. This is a law, and one enterprise cannot do anything. For example, we are manufacturing profiles, and this profile is used in any skyscraper of the world. Uh, well, it is a very expensive production. We do have 
uh, we should have we should have a cooperation with the copper producing factories but we can we can produce anchors and if we cannot produce if we cannot manufacture the whole construction how can we manufacture this anchor we can do the welding equipment we have one enthusiast uh, he cooperates with, with euros and uh, but at the same time it's like a closed circle uh, he, this person is an enthusiast he is a great specialist but he cannot move forward his product and secondly organizational matters for example I've created a small enterprise 25 years ago. Yes, we've grown up, but we have a turnover of more than 2 billion rubles, and we decided that we are a big enterprise. The state took a decision for us, but it means to be a big enterprise, a large enterprise, it means that you will be checked every year. Then for another year, you will go to the court and you will have a case against this checking company. When this company or tax company uh, will come to the small enterprise and they immediately tell them that you have to find us a fine for one million rubles because we have a plan. And it means that this small enterprise just immediately has to give one million rubles to this company. Uh, uh, in our company, Every every employee pays two hundred thousand rubles annually, and in the course of the year, oh, well, we received twenty one checking companies. Out of them, uh, seventeen seventeen check companies come to us to check whatever they want to check, and four companies come from tax police. I've used a lot of paper, a lot of transportation, a lot of cartridges, but my expenditures for these Czech companies were uh, 1,500,000. And it means that some people in my company, they are dealing only with these Czech companies. They do not work. I'm talking about the construction area. I'm not talking about other areas. I am talking only about construction companies. So, well, these small companies, it is for them, the, the rule is and the reason is to be next to Nicole because they have lots of niches. What, what, is the, what amount of taxes uh, your company pays? Techno Nicole, just give us an approximate figure. It's a transparent figure. One factory pays, one factory pays annually uh, 100 million rubles annually. Well, this is a very impressive figure, but it depends how many people work. We, we have a personnel of 300 employees. RSPP will provide the report about what's happening in our business. And I know that the vast majority of entrepreneurs, they say that these regulating authorities, tax authorities and other authorities, they torture these companies. And we have to do something, I don't know what, but we'd have to do something to avoid this situation. And Kevin, I would like to ask you how these new companies, how they find their place in the market. Is it simple for them? And do you have many new newcomers, for example, in the period of five years? U.S. We have um, more clear regulations and taxes, and I hire people and accountants to wade through the regulations and taxes, um, and I think we're more clear. The problem is because they're more clear, we still have to hire people, and um, there's a lot more competition. It's easier to get into business, but because it's easier to get into business, we have more competition. So I think there's a, there's a trade-off in a lot of ways. And I just want to point out, I was listening to the other two speakers, I want to point out that um, you know, in, in most economies, when we roll back the clock through human history, 
The basic needs are food, air, water, and shelter. And construction is an integral part of quality of life. And when I look at economies, the role that we're playing in this economy and the global economy is significant from a GDP standpoint. And it's incumbent upon, and it's ironic that we're here in an entrepreneurship conference, it's very smart people how to figure out how to create that innovation. And I want to point out the different types of innovation. First is there's incremental innovation, which he very dramatically demonstrated the incremental innovation that's happening. And there's transformational innovation. And within those two different types of innovation, there's technological innovation, there's business process innovation, and social innovation. And he very eloquently demonstrated not only an incremental and transformational, but in all three categories of the innovation. So I think it's incumbent upon the entrepreneurs to figure out what that business model is and that uniqueness about the business model to be able to take advantage of either that incremental or transformational in innovation and leverage the resources and time we have to make a profit. And that is the spirit of entrepreneurship and creating something that didn't exist before. And the very important role that construction plays in any economy. So thank you. Угу. Спасибо большое. Я хочу еще вот какой вопрос. Uh, where should we e expect a breakthrough in uh, the sector of building materials? Certainly in the niches where Technical doesn't operate <laughs> well, but w where uh, could be a breakthrough? What do we actually need most in this market? Well, uh, uh, well, it's metal structures. So those who know designing and know th uh, those who know uh, the Eurocode system, well, in the description of Eurocode, you will find 70% of metal structures. I'm a member to the British Institute of Metal Structures, and I haven't seen a Russian project um, in it. Though I participated in all uh, award ceremonies all over Europe, uh, if you were in London, you could see that everything is built from metal. Uh, you know, this uh, and uh, which uh, is, uh, just was built by Forster in London, it's from metal. Well, well, there was a trend to build wooden houses uh, under the Canadian style, but now in the UK we see uh, mostly light metal structures. In France, oh, well, they are looking um, living spaces uh, because there are quite a lot of divorces and uh, well, there are a lot of regulations regarding uh, living space, but uh, well, a way out is to apply metal structures in the building of residential houses because a metal uh, carcass in a house it can be recycled for 99%, and this is part of the sustainable design. So, uh, and what should you do with a crushed brick or something else? So, this is the most environmentally clean material. And the future is for it. The so materials with such plasticity module, uh, well, it's not inherent to any other material in the world. I don't think you will <laughs> see su such in uh, the future of 50 years. Now, I would like to give my answer. So I am, uh, uh, I'm an, I've been enjoying this touch technologies and pilot project for many years. Uh, well, you know, but we uh, did a lot of researches in five areas uh, uh, of the development of construction materials. This is glass, 
just due to its high energy efficiency. These are insulating material sealers. Uh, these are concrete and cement. And, you know, there's just a, a, wise, oh, a vast space to explore and certainly composites, composite materials and uh, different ones. So the, and uh, the main idea is to reduce uh, deadlines, to, reduce, uh, uh, to extend shelf lives and so on. So what we need is need a um, correct approach is to calculating life cycles, energy modeling, software in this area, specialists and experts in this area who would be able to calculate in advance the life uh, cycle of the material. So because the, uh, all the materials should be compliant with the existing standards. And for different structures, we need different approaches. It could be a metal structure or, you know, somewhere we cannot uh, apply metal structure. Uh, and from the very start, we, we need a correct modeling of a building, so uh, how it will be functioning, how it will be recycled uh, after the life cycle is over. And uh, we need such uh, software. Uh, and we actually, and they are actually insufficient in our market. You had a question? Юрий, uh, можно нам тоже вопрос озвучить. Uh, well, residential houses can be built uh, without any expert reviews. I know quite a lot of companies who do this and uh, uh, manufacture such metal carcasses. But uh, uh, some people are actually astonished uh, when they encounter an the idea that they will live in a metal structure. So why light metal structures are not popular in residential housing? That because there is nothing to steal. You know, it's easy to steal cement, crushed stone, sand, but it's not easy to steal a metal beam uh, and you won't have a house if it's leaking. So what should you do with that actually if you if you steal it? So so it's absolutely unprofitable to build metal uh, structured houses. I would like to speak English. Kia. I'm representing a, a former American company. It's called Butler Manufacturing. And we have supplied the first steel building to Russia in the 70s. And that was the Crown Plaza World Trade Center. And nowadays we are operating a factory in Yaroslavl. And the biggest problem here to supply what you call a modern steel structure or a modern steel building, it's actually the legislation, is the technical regulament. Why? Nobody, we don't feel that somebody is ready, ready to change it. So all what we produce, it's very modern, but doesn't really fit into the Russian SNP. So it's very difficult to get it accepted by designers, by the expertise, even though we have to fight for each and every project where we prove that we have savings, for example, of 40% in the quantity of metal compared to traditional design. So the question is, when do you think that we will have the euro code implemented and accepted here as a norm of design? Mm. Da, da. Когда будет... No, they won't uh, take us back. Uh, he asked when will we, uh, one with the hero codes will be implemented here in our, to our practice. 
Uh, I don't have an exact answer to it, uh, but uh, the government, I already mentioned today, well, takes care of that. Uh, they, we signed a framework agreement in this area, and we are discussing an issue of uh, its implementation. Uh, so what am I doing uh, as a, uh, a chairman of the Russian Association of Metal Constructors? So you, you, we mentioned uh, Eurocode 3. This is a Eurocode which covers uh, light uh, steel structures. And uh, depending on uh, its uh, presentation, its reflection in our standards, and introduced to our guiding documents, so uh, we'll be able to expand uh, such construction. We today uh, we work together with uh, me, uh, metal specialists, and uh, they have an interest in uh, the progress with the regulations. Medvedev also is personally interested in the progress of this job. So me personally uh, talk to the Moscow. Uh, build, uh, building or construction university, and we are now preparing the fourth part of uh, the, the second part of the Eurocode 4, which also concerns steel uh, structures. Uh, but here we need a methodology to implement Eurocodes, and uh, I think you all, all of you are engineers. Uh, well, the uh, X is X and uh, Y have different directions in your accounts. First, we should agree on the terminology, on definitions, and after that, we should pass over to all the rest. So who, those who calculated an equation can see that 50% of figures have a kind of a political notion. Uh, they reflect the will of a politician. Because a lot of these figures cannot be proven theoretically. They are political figures, and it's a long way in Europe because the Europe has been working on over this issue for 40 years, from 1972, and haven't finalized these uh, activities yet. So, and we've just started to the very beginning of it. But uh, very soon, uh, during the current year, uh, we will be able to show how to calculate loads, how to arrange the design process and how to to push this uh, document uh, to the legal environment because it is to be binding for the members of the commission responsible for the acceptance of projects in this country. So you had a question. You're welcome. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Andres Rigioni from Costa Rica. I am an entrepreneur. I own a light gauge steel framing company, or I'm a partner in, and we've, we've found that a big niche for us and for other entrepreneurs is trying to take the construction off-site within the industrialization, because there's a lot of inefficiency weather-wise um, because of the hard rains that we get. So my question for the three of you, I hope the three can answer, is what are the strongest inefficiencies you see in your markets right now that are actually an opportunity for uh, companies that are just starting out. What? Если я правильно поняла, значит, вопрос был с вашей точки зрения. So you, you asked about the most inefficient part in the system of Russian business. We can be breached by emerging companies. Metal, first of all, that uh, was Yuri said. I don't agree with him. Uh, we should look to the experience of um, uh, the United States. Uh, we'll find uh, that uh, they moved forward far away in uh, in wood processing here in Russia, it's kind of a craft, you know. So in uh, carcass uh, uh, construction, consumes calibrated wood in the United States. But here in Russia, while in the uh, timber market, you will find actually a mess. I think this is a huge 
uh, niche that is to be uh, developed in Russia in the near future. It is wood, not metal, first of all, and it's uh, uh, consumption in uh, uh, low rises. Uh, so there, it is a clear trend. And uh, there you can find a great opportunity for a new business. So getting back to metal, so they, uh, as far as I got, the colleague has uh, a company, a metal company in the sphere of metal structures. Yes, is that so? Do you own a metal, st a metal structure company? Light gauge steel framing, but really it's about technology for construction. So right now there's an opportunity there for us, but if it's metal or if it's wood for us, it's all the same. Mm -hmm. As long as we introduce efficiency with wood framing or metal framing, and wood is certainly more cost effective. So I'm interested in what other inefficiencies you see that entrepreneurs can take advantage of. Mm -hmm. I want to point out three major uh, movements that, that's happening in construction, at least from my perspective, and I, I know it's a very different market here. One is the design-build movement, and that's the concept of the owner, the architect, and the contractor all working together instead of it being a, a, a bid-type relationship. Um, my company itself does more of a design-assist type method, which is an, a, sort of a, a medium ground between the traditional bid method in a, des a design build. The second one is, you know, um, computers and CAD drawings is two-dimensional. Um, the, the other movement and trend is toward three-dimensional conceptualization. There's a saying in the construction business, you build it twice. You build it on paper first, and then in real life. And with the realization of being able to conceptualize things in three-dimensional and, and be able to um, do uh, design better and procurement better, uh, the, the elements working together creates a lot of synergies and, uh, and efficiencies. Um, the last piece is the movement of sustainable design. So there's, in some people's opinions, three distinct trends, but more importantly, those three trends working together creates a lot of um, efficiencies and cost benefits and a, a new way of doing things. And, and to answer your question more directly, um, I personally think that the opportunities are more local and regional in scope, meaning, you know, where I'm from after Hurricane Katrina, the worst natural disaster in U.S. history, um, with uh, labor costs going up 25 percent, material costs going up 35 percent. In that moment of time, there were unique opportunities in sheetrock and, and certain trades. Um, once the economy stabilized more, the eastern region with with the global economy the way it's going on there's these movements and shifts and I think it's up to the local uh, contractors and subcontractors to figure out what those opportunities are it's it's it's, it's impossible to make a blanket statement I think um, metal costs change um, there's these big movements but there's also regional movements in that as well Thank you very much. Uh, well, now just where should we, uh, where can we find these growth points? Uh, well, the, uh, a trend uh, to uh, the uh, construction of uh, low rises have been announced here in this country. Does it somehow impact the construction material around? Did it shift the accents, the focuses of the market? Uh, did it give a start to new areas and directions? Uh, certainly, a lot of changed, and I felt that in the 28-29, when our oils uh, uh, fell down threefold, uh, especially in the construction for industry, uh, yet uh, uh, the construction of private houses grew. And uh, at the time, I was building my personal house. And uh, the builders came up to me and said, I, we couldn't buy cables. So because uh, of the, uh, you know, the uh, demand was so high that uh, for all kind of uh, construction materials and accessories for private housing, 
uh, grew dr drastically. So the crisis actually gave an impetus to this. Uh, and uh, what did you see? Well, uh, it's a similar picture. So uh, the crisis actually brought uh, uh, was was not uh, so uh, you know just influential for low rise for low rise uh, uh, building uh, uh, so uh, the uh, sales and uh, uh, the products for low rise uh, building grew actually due to the crisis well in this uh, i don't think that we should uh, uh, just adapt our segment dramatically for uh, the uh, low rise construction but we feel that the consumption in this area of the narrow line of products has grown um, so one of the uh, most um, with the highest capacity, uh, segments with the highest capacity is a segment of uh, low rise construction. So the, I think that is a, a long term trend. Uh, though um, there are some other plans uh, regarding high rises across Russia, but I think that low rises well account for a lot of production in this uh, sector. So we are wrapping up. And to uh, sum up, uh, we had an uh, individual topic, a social responsibility. You know, uh, for us journalists, it is a very interesting question. Ask about the social responsibility. And you will have 15 minutes of rest because a person won't give you a clear answer. He will just be beating about the bush for 15 minutes. We don't have time for social responsibility discussion, but uh, just, uh, just uh, a couple of sentences about social responsibility. How do you understand this? And where is your personal social responsibility in front of the country, in front of your business sector and yourself? We uh, had three, three areas of social responsibility. First uh, area. Uh, it's, for instance, we have a birthday of the company, and on that day we planted uh, we planted trees, uh, well, just equal to the pay uh, to the our to our employees on the payroll. Three thousand trees, actually. So uh, we discussed this with the Moscow government, and we had to do a lot to get a permit for that from uh, the authorities. But after that, a lot of uh, in a lot of regions, uh, this tradition was uh, replicated, and uh, uh, this is a very good tradition. We uh, work uh, with the orphans' houses as well, and uh, number three is uh, uh, we support uh, the best lawn sport. <coughs> <coughs> sport clubs. Uh, um, and so we try to develop uh, um, a ski centers uh, for for young people. So, uh, Kevin, this is a question to you. Uh, so, uh, so social responsibility, how do you understand it? First, I want to recognize that the construction industry itself, again, contributes a significant portion of every community's glo uh, GDP. Closer? No. Okay. Can, okay, you get it better? The construction industry provides a lot of quality jobs for a lot of people. It provides a lot of global GDP for communities. The construction jobs have subcontractors, and those subcontractors have a lot of workers. So we have to recognize, first off, that this industry creates a significant portion of jobs, and that is a social responsibility, right? First off. Second is, on the jobs that we do, we also make it a point to include smaller contractors to help them grow. We have a choice on who we contract with. We also look to the smaller contractors to help them out and assist them. Then the third aspect that I view is the types of jobs that we pursue. We are a low-rise contractor. In the city that I work in and in our region, we don't have a lot of large buildings, so we don't really have a choice of building high-rises. Most of the buildings that we build are a, another entrepreneur that has a vision in mind of something they want to create, 
a restaurant, uh, some other building that they want to build. And I view construction business is the m helping people manifest their vision to go into commerce. So for me, it's not just important that we're building buildings. What's important is what that building does for humanity. We choose the jobs. We make it a point to help people that don't understand the construction process, particularly um, some of the particular jobs or assisted living facilities, libraries, school gymnasiums. And in one particular job that we just finished is a, they take at-risk kids off the streets and they do training. And many of these people that are doing really important work in our communities don't understand the construction process. So our corporate social responsibility is to make an extra effort to help them understand it and lead them through that process of construction, which goes back to that first trend, and that is the design-build concept of helping people get through it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yuri. So this is your minute of glory. So my social responsibility is to pay all taxes, which we can avoid, and uh, and wait. And I have got the talent to guide people and to organize production. And I won't dig my talent down into the earth. So my company had only five employees on uh, on the payroll, and now uh, 200. So this is my task to give them a, these people a chance to make more and more money for them to, uh, to, to sustain their families, and then philanthropy. Thank you very much. Uh, well, we are, uh, we've done, a, it was gr a great session, and I hope that it was interesting and useful for you. And now you can take out your uh, uh, cell phones. And the sound to them. Thank you very much. You will have a chance to have private talks, and I hope that you'll take advantage of them.